welcome one and all to the Square Z GAA Tactics and Analysis a podcast with your host here, Paddy McGill, and the protagonist, the brainchild of the operation, Mr. Stephen O'Mara. How are you, Stephen? Not so bad, Paddy. Possibly better than yourself after yesterday, but uh, not doing too badly. Yeah, I think it's going to be a long season for Donegal, and a short in one way. Long, maybe, maybe metaphorically but thankfully you told me there a couple of days ago we're not covering the Donegal Monaghan game okay so division one results from the weekend Mayo 214 Kerry 110 Galway 16 points Tyrone 13 points Ross Common continue their impressive start with a 112 to 12 victory over Armagh and it finished Monaghan one goal and 20 points Donegal 15 points now for anybody new to the show we are dissecting two matches that were aired live over any given weekend. And over the weekend, so we're going to be looking at Ross Common and Tyrone. But first, Porrick Joyce's Galway with that 16 point to 13 victory over Tyrone yesterday in Tum Stadium. Just for anybody that missed that one, Stephen, just from a stats point of view, give us a brief overview, a quick summary of that one. Yeah, well, we'll have a quick look here um, at the, the general stats and we'll get, just get a, a nice overview of the game. So we'll see here, I suppose, from, from the from the outset. And again, to remind any, anyone new here, so the, the tick line here is the actual score line uh, and the skinnier line is the expected score, which is to say all things being equal, distance, uh, difficulty of shot, level of pressure what a team could have expected to have scored. Now, look, it's insignificant in the end that Tyrone's expected score is slightly higher than Galway's, but coming down the stretch, Galway's was actually higher, as you can see there, around 67, 68 minutes. So even if it had gone to expected score where Tyrone didn't shoot particularly well, um, Galway would have been leading going late into the game. Uh, but I suppose you see here, I, I will go through phase by phase that up to the first quarter, you know, Tyrone looked really, really uh, comfortable in, in, in terms uh, that that they had the, the wind in their faces. We'll see here, um, you know, Miles expect to score in Tyrone's favour but we'll, 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 in, in the end of the game. But we'll see here um, in that first section of the game, you know, it was, again, concern for me, Galway. Could have won either game, could have lost either game so far, but they've had a low phase of possession with shots. And after 16 minutes, you were saying again, four shots from nine, 44%, wasn't looking great. Um, you know, Tyrone playing into the wind had had 57% of phases with shots, and it was it was too good to go away at that stage. And you got the sense as you moved into that second quarter um, that Tyrone were perfectly happy to slow the game down, as it did against Donegal in a similar scenario with the wind in their face. Um, but the game did turn there in that section. And as we'll see, it was, you know, largely to do with the fact that Galway started uh, winning their kickouts. They pressed up and we're going to see and a few, a few other nuances we're going to look at. Uh, a, a few diamonds there that might have slipped under. The, some wouldn't and some would have slipped under the radar. But again, you look here at the third section of the game, it looked like Tyrone um we're we're coming right back into that game at that stage you, you see the expected score chart there they go from seven three down to uh is it nine eight down and ten nine down and you just feel they've clawed that lead back so well with that wind in their back it's all going as it should and then boom um the, the, there's a phase of play for nine ten minutes where you see here go he you know, scored in five points to no score uh, possibly overshot throw, maybe undershot, but ultimately it was a period of dominance. Galway, you know, shots in five of the six phases, Tyrone and four out of six, but you can see Galway's expected score per shot, 73% in that phase, Tyrone's 40%, and we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment, and I suppose by that stage, it was nearly all over bar the shout, and it was 13-8, and with that big win, it was never really likely to, to change from there. Yeah, sure. Okay, so... Let's rewind to the start. At the outset there, you mentioned the word concern. You had your worries for Galway, especially in that opening quarter. Yeah, and as I say, just go back to that, to, to, to that, uh, sorry, that's the whole game, to that 
first chart and it is look we'll, we'll look at it in more detail as the year goes on but there is definitely for me even as i said in the all ireland final last year go i only shot on 55 percent of phases and probably the superb shooting on the day by shane walsh bumped things up they only got 41 and i think 42 percent shots in their first two games and you're looking here after 16 minutes and you're saying you know tyrone are very comfortable here into the wind this is a third game in a row where Galway with the win, they're looking at, you know, 44% shots, four from nine phases. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just not looking, it's not looking good for them at the time if we're being realistic about it. Um, and as I say, Morgan was out soloing the ball on the spot as, as, as he did against Dunny Gall for a lot of the latter stage of the first half. And it was at that point in time, I suppose, looking pretty plain sailing uh, for Tyrone. Yeah, okay. What changed then in the second quarter? Um, I suppose the, the key thing here really was, um, if we look at the first quarter, you know, Tyrone were getting their shots off, you know, or their, their kickouts off. And you'll see here, Galway have three men committed to the full forward line on the press. And funny, this is very reminiscent of how the Derry semi-final changed last year, where Derry were getting their kicks to the D in the first 20 minutes. Galway were being forced long, and I'm sitting in the queues of stand thinking, there's only going to be one outcome here, but Galway completely flipped it in the second quarter and really aggressively in the second half. Same story. And maybe they're saying, well, let's see, can we get away with three inside at the start? And if we need more, we'll get more. But Tyrone were getting those short kickouts off uh, in the early phases. But at the point where that, that big change in the game came, uh, you're going to see uh, as we move on here, this is a kick at the 20 and 22nd minute. And do we see the difference here? You can see one, two, three, four in around the D. Um, another three on the 45 and one inside. So they've all of a sudden, they've got eight committed to that area. And all of a sudden, even when these Tyrone boys run in late, there's no real space for them to get the, the, the easy hands on ball. And ultimately, that's what, that's what goalkeepers want. That's what players in that part of the field want. So the major change there on the, on the kickouts. They started forcing... Uh, Tyrone Long uh, and in that period if I refer to my notes here they won they won six Galway won six in that second quarter and Tyrone won two of their own kickouts uh, and scored two points wasn't as defining as it may have looked but prior to that you know Tyrone were getting their, their short kickouts off and making a bit of hay so you know I'd love to give you something more uh, more sexy but Galway started winning the kickouts is the the, the, the primary factor Okay, but it's still more subtle than that, though. And I know that that's that's obvious enough. And I know nobody has ever linked Stephen O'Mara with obvious, but it's probably more nuanced than that. Is that fair? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, and I suppose something I picked up on um, last week uh, maybe flew in under the radar, but uh, the 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 lost wizard, as I called up to somebody yesterday, Ian Burke is back. Kind of disappeared off the radar, but one of the absolute top forwards in the country. Uh, and not alone Ian Burke, but it was a really interesting stat because in the in the first quarter, Galway got off three short kickouts. And Tyrone gave him the kickouts, which is interesting. Because in modern Division One football, I would generally say giving up kickouts is bad value because you've got to expect a Division One, the top 10, 11 team in, in inter-county football to profit off their short kickouts. To score three or four out of every 10 at least and maybe only concede one or two on the turnover. But Galway weren't, thrown big wind, let them have it. I'm not convinced by the strategy on the whole, but it was working for Tyrone. They'd given up three. Galway had got one low percentage shot off on one of them, didn't get shots off on the other two. But they got two in that period, but there's a really subtle detail. And look, when I, we're trying to take baby steps at the moment, we're looking at whole team. But when I look at individual stats, um, it shows what, ball went through what players' hands and what the outcome was. And there's a really key element here that the, 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 the of the two they scored in that second quarter of the short kickers that were given up. Uh, the first one goes through Ian Burke, uh, Dylan McHugh, and uh, Young Tierney's hands. And it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant score by Tierney. Um, and then you look at the next one, it goes through Tierney, Ian Burke, Paul Conroy, Jack Lane, very part of Joyce cornerbacks coming up getting scores. It's Jack Lane kicks the score. 
but the magic is weaved by the three boys. And if you were to ask me going onto the field yesterday, who were the three boys? Actually, Tierney, I'm only uh, starting to learn about. I hadn't seen a huge amount of them. We'll discuss them later on. But when the ball went through those three boys' hands, magic happened. That wasn't necessarily happening elsewhere. Okay, that all said and done, though. Tyrone were dominant again, though, with the wind. Because it's yeah, a huge factor yeah. here. It's a huge factor here. It always is on the Western seaboard, but it uh, always blows a minor hurricane in Galway as well. Yeah, <laughs> look, don't need all carry, like, but Tyrone <laughs> took full advantage of that. Well, Tum in particular, you see here the throw they were in the first half. You know, when, when Galway did push those numbers up, they weren't just losing the kicks. The Galway boys were queuing up under them. Mm. Um, and you'll see there in the in the first half, um, where where Tyrone struggled on those kickouts, anything that went over the 65, basically they lost. So they had to get hands on ball on the D. As we showed, they couldn't. Galway were getting them off nice and handy. But in that second half, it, it completely flipped all of a sudden. Um the the impetus was with Tyrone. And again, when we look when we when we looked at those phases of possession to scores, um they they what have we got what have we got here? Um they started winning. They, they won five out of eight of Galway's kickouts and they scored three off them. And again, we'll see here the same principle. It's just, and there's something Tyrone weren't to. Tyrone won it all Ireland with a fixed box of six press, three inside, three outside. Um, it was an interesting all Ireland. It's worth a, an episode on its own. Uh, but they've definitely changed tack that they've got four inside there into the wind. Now they're forcing Galway long. In that period after half time, uh, they won five out of eight of Galway's kickouts. And they scored three points off them. But crucially, they got two of their own short kickouts and they went up the field. They'll bury again. And it's not unlike the Monaghan team, although Tyrone are the horse of a different colour. Um, they went up, played kind of methodical football and scored two off their own short kickouts. So they were 10 9 up and really looked absolutely dominant everywhere. And from going 7 3 down at half time to 10 9 down, you really had to back them, especially the way manner in which they were forcing the, the, the kickouts long. Yeah, so they look to be in a healthy place there. But yet again, we have a shift in pattern and maybe radical turnaround is maybe a bit sensationalist, but there was a huge shift once again, Stephen. No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is uh, radical to say it, Paddy. Um, and I suppose, look, the Martin. You know, when you analyse Dublin and Cork, ultimately, what did the key score come from? Jack McCaffrey got the ball and he's faster than everybody. And he went by three Cork lads. You know, you can yeah, dicky up tactics as long as you want, but that's ultimately what put Dublin two points up when it was in the melting pot. Uh, come at the hour, come at the man. And, you know, as I haven't seen much of Matthew Tierney, and he got, I don't always agree with the man of the match, but Tierney plucked two savage kicks out of the sky. You know, and when the when their backs were really to the wall, into that wind, Tyrone were forcing them along. So as number one, Tierney comes up and he catches two monster kickouts. But again, what's really crucial is the key kickout that puts the, is it one point up? It, I think it puts them two up when their backs are really against the wall. Tierney wins it. Who comes off the shoulder? John Daly. Statistically, one of the most significant of the attacking defenders and, and defending defenders in the country. Uh, John Daly takes it off him. Gives it to one of the most polished footballers in the country, Paul Conroy. And who comes in? I was taking to do a piece on it, I won't, but uh, have a look back at the score. It was on TG Carr. Uh, e. Burt manipulates angles and lines, gets in the back door, score. And if you wanted the ball to go through any four players' hands, there to forward. And what's on that goal we feel at the time, and I'll go close to saying at any given time, maybe add one or two more in there. But it was just a pattern again of the players that went through. And again, Tierney. And I can't talk enough about him because I've watched him. I haven't spotted him because he wasn't there when I was working with Galway. Um, but I spotted him against NUIG against UCD a few weeks back. And 15 minutes in, I said, this lad is something. Uh, he was just such a game controller, so smart. And the second kick out he won, and I suppose it runs against maybe how the game went away from Tyrone, particularly um, in this phase. He won one kick out and the temptation was there to kick it down the line. To, again, maybe a low percentage play. He looked, he hesitated. No, 
played the ball to the left side, they went up and they got a slightly more pick and poke score. So that real composure there from Tierney, who we'll talk about again in a minute, but just two big kickouts went to the right hands, and next thing Galway were, were were back dominating the game. Yeah, they're such an array of intelligent footballers, and none more so than Tierney. So look, it ended up in a really impressive win for Galway. Any final thoughts, takeaways from that one? Yeah, well, look, I suppose before I go to the final takeaways there, you know, we, we look at the thrown shot map here and, you know, shot maps can be very telling in a lot of ways. Now, a programmer will probably be something for this weekend they don't have, so you'll have to bear with me. But if you look at thrown shot map, it looks decent enough to distances, but where that phase, Galway went and scored five points to no score in a period of uh, maybe eight, nine minutes. As I say, two were those ones I talk about tyranny. But Tyrone were still getting their hands on ball a little bit. But if you look at those red shots, kind of bordering the D and the 21, and a few to the right between the 14 and the 21, they were under a lot of pressure. Or they were kicking over blocking hands. And again, that might look like a pretty shot map, but it's not as pretty as it looks. You know, you look at Darren McCurry here, look at the trajectory that ball has to take. That's a low percentage shot. Uh, we look here at Dara Canavan. He's all the skill in the world, but I think he's a bit inclined to take shots that aren't on. Again, on the shot map, that looks lovely, but look at the trajectory of that ball. It has to go up and over. You know, it's it's a it, that's less than a 50% shot, even though the shot map might make it look like a 90%er. It's not. You look at this one, uh, Richie Donnelly, you know, would a left footed free taker kick a free from there? I'm not sure they would. Haven't done the homework. I don't remember being a left footer, but if he is a if he's a right footer, it's definitely low percentage. And then as well, and the key thing, and it tied him a boat game this week. When they were playing into the wind, they kept it through the hands. They played that classic Ulster football, which I think, broadly speaking, is is tactically superior to most models. And I'm gonna call Kerry and Carl Finn an outlier there, but for the the non-wizardry footballers, I, I think it's a good model. But are that inclination with the wind to start you overusing it, kicking it into a into a zone on the fence. When I mean, you look at what's here, you know, is it like a Bruce McShane in there? There's a sweeper in front of him, there's a full back on him, and the five men in the break with the positions are all Galway. And they just kicked low percentage ball and they tried to the quick transition a lot when they probably didn't need to hands on ball, settle it down. And I felt they just kicked that game a little bit away in that period. Gave the ball back to Galway. And as I say, Galway played their ball in that period. Is it just go over back, be patient, wait until gaps, bring all the throne players to one side of the Galway rather, bring them to one side of the field, come back over? What what we've seen in basically when it works in Ulster over the past couple of years? I, 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 think, there's a, I think there's a PhD in it, genuinely, Paddy. I can calculate in my head, but over the last 10 years, Club especially, county less so, but so, to some extent we're going to see it. It's why we put Galway Tyrone before our bar Ross Common because they're the common team. But the amount of time you see a game kind of level or close at half time, well, the wind will win it for them in the second half. Uh, more often than not, teams start just kicking low percentage ball, thinking the wind will take shots over that aren't on, get the ball in quickly. I think if Tyrone had kept to the same model, but with a further shooting zone that win in the second half, they certainly wouldn't have given Galway the impetus to take that period where they won, that they outscored a five points no score, and ultimately the game was done and dusted by that stage. Well, you called me actually in round one, even though they beat Cork, you said there were, that is unlikely to happen again. They were taking on low percentage shots, which actually worked in their favour, ironically enough, against Cork first day out, but they done it again against Derry in Owen Beg on Saturday evening, and it didn't work out. So I'm going to give you kudos for that one. Any final takeaways on this one then, Stephen? Yeah, I was I was in two I was in three minds between doing a slight individual piece on Paul Conroy, who just had a magnificent performance again yeah. yesterday. To be honest, I think part of Joyce's style probably suits Paul more than Kevin Walsh's did. I, I, he won more matches proportionately under Kevin mm. Walsh, but as an individual magical footballer, I think you know he, he gets to show all his colours more. Uh, Ian Burke, I was tempted, but I'll I'll get there again. But Matthew Turney, right? He got man in the match, and look, everybody can see the skills. And I'm often critical of high skill players because they the little subtle nuances of the other team have the ball or the low percentage shots, and everyone remembers the spectacular one. 
Tierney is here kicking ball, kicking points from play for 40 yards, from dead ball from 46, 47 yards. He's winning the key kickouts. He's the key man in that trio of Conroy, Burke, and himself. But what's really, really brilliant, watch this here. This is at this stage where Galway dominated the game. Normally, offensive players with all that array, they don't really like defending, and they're generally not good at defending. But you watch this from a guy who has the fuller array as an offensive player, as a line breaker, as a game controller. Look at his body position. This is anybody, any kid, any adult, anybody who plays football. Watch his body position. Now watch a really key subtle detail. As the throw man takes off, his footwork is impeccable. Springs off the, the non-goal side foot. Knee to the goal, powering forward to get pace. So he's not done for pace. And as the hand pass has been hit, near hand tackle, that got turned over and it was probably the key phase of the game. I'm looking at this guy, as I say, I hadn't really noticed until that NUIG UCD game. Uh, if I'm picking an Ireland team tomorrow and I'm looking for middle third men, right, Kieran Uncle Kenny, everyone knows, is my number one, uh, eight all Ireland's. I'm not going to say, any, you know, he's a few a few years to go, but I'm going to say number two, Matthew Tierney. He, this guy has it all. Okay, so... Already, I think he has an all-star one because of you now, Stephen O'Mara. That's that's good work. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant victory for Galway, uh, overcoming Tyrone there, 16 points to 13. That moves Galway up to third in the table. Just the And they travel to Letterkenny next Sunday to take on a struggling Donegal side, who, of course, as we said, lost out, got hammered yesterday, thumped really to Monaghan and St. Chirnock's Park in Clonus for Tyrone. They travel to the Keel Park in Castle Bar. Of course, Mayo with that emphatic victory over Kerry at the weekend as well. That one on Saturday night. So the table in full. Who would have thought it? Ross Common, who will be, who will be covering very shortly on six points. Mayo for Galway and Armagh, both of three. And then we have Kerry, Tyrone, Monaghan and Donegal all on two points. And if you've just come from... Mars or the moon, it's two teams as always get relegated. So, as I said, Russ Common, three wins from three under the stewardship and guidance of Davy Burke, of course, Donegal's Mark McHugh, an all star and an all Ireland winner with Donegal in 2012. He's uh, one of the coaches there as well. So, listen, what a fantastic start for uh, the Connacht side! Brilliant, um, fortress. Dr. Hyde Park. Stephen, again, for anybody that may have missed this one, from a stats point of view, just give us a quick summary of uh, of events there. Yeah, well, again, I suppose one or two key concepts. We'll look at the whole overview of the game, and I'm going to say at this stage uh, about Ross Common. listen, I won't say 50-50. They were all tight games. They could have lost all three. I won't say as quickly as they could have won them, but the key point I will say is, and you know, you talk about a, B, C, and D, phases of possession to shots, uh, assuming they're reasonably high percentage shots, is what win games. And you'll see at this stage, Ross Common uh, got 64% of shots off. Armagh 66, highly impressive as well. But Ross Common, are, that's actually Ross Common's lowest. They were 65 plus in their previous two games. At this stage of the year, Ross Common, they've won three out of three. They're top of the league. They have the highest phase of possession to shot ratio in the league. Uh, and ultimately, I suppose there, there's a fairly simple A leads to D uh, pattern there. Now, I suppose what we're going to look at in this game, which is is really intriguing, is when we look at these uh, figures, <clears throat> expect the score per 10 phases. They both have 4.3 points. Um, we look at uh, scores per 10 phases, Roscommon 4.2, Armagh 3.8. Now, there's a nuance to the shot conversion rate. If, you, if anyone is looking at it, the fact that <clears throat> Roscommon scored a penalty that Plays with the figures a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, with a few other little details, this came down to the fact that total phases, Ross Common at 36 and Armand at 32, which ultimately came down to uh, Ross Common being more aggressive on the kickouts, which ultimately, I suppose, was one of the key factors that won the game. Because uh, obviously, if they've got the same expected score per 10 phases, it should be a 50 50 game except that one team has more phases than the other. So, you know, we look on here the expected score. Uh, this was <laughs> similar to the Tyrone game. You know, you're looking here again, 14, 15 minutes. 
And Armagh are playing into that huge hide wind, and it's a it's, it's a divil of a wind. You go on weather.com, you know, yeah. two o'clock for a, a three o'clock game to hide, the same 15 kilometer an hour wind, and you get into hide, and it's a 35 kilometer an hour wind, and that's what we had again, maybe more. And you're looking at Armagh as sort of what 26 minutes or five three up playing into a huge wind. Um, and at that stage, there, you know, we're, we're going to look at the reasons why that was. Um, but Roscommon having serious trouble breaking them down. Again, it's a very processed Ulster game uh, by Armagh, and we'll look at that pattern again. Um, Roscommon came back into what I'm going to say a little bit randomly in the in the second quarter. I say randomly, sorry, I meant to give an analogy for this uh, at the start uh, and how and why uh, they came into that in the second quarter. Not to take credit away, it's absolutely due. Third quarter, they blew Armagh away and they game man in the last, the last uh, quarter or so. But you know, I, I remember I fell into playing poker a number of years ago, and at a time where I was substitute teaching day by day, I ended up playing poker night by night instead. And people assumed I was a fantastic poker player, and I used to say no, like I couldn't go to Texas where there's a culture of poker playing and parameters are respected, and you know you don't raise left to the dealer, for example, with or under the gun, so to speak. Any poker player there with a queen jack. The, the, the paint looks lovely. A lot of poor players fall in love with that hand, but it, it, it's a low percentage play. Ross Common aren't doing anything spectacular. They're doing the correct, simple. It's Roy Keane stuff. They're doing all the correct parameters. And it's other teams are maybe, to use the poker analogy, playing a queen, a queen and a jack unsuited under the gun. Uh, and then you know the queen comes to the table, but maybe somebody else has the ace queen, and that's the best analogy I could give. That Ross Common are really solid and stable, Roy Keane style football. Um, and that game actually swung more on what Armagh did well in phases and badly in phases than uh Ross Common themselves, who were just perfectly stable, I will say, for three games, yeah. Ronnie O'Sullivan had one as well to paraphrase him. They asked him about one particular game taking on hard shots, and he said, I didn't need to. I just played the simple ones to absolute perfection, so didn't give himself with his cue ball and that. So fair play to them. But look, I was in Clonus yesterday. I was following it online on Twitter, and I was reading Armas 6, Russ Common 3 after about 25, 26, 27 minutes Arma would have been delighted maybe plain sailing is uh, a little bit of a slight fabrication there but they were certainly in the ascendancy yeah absolutely and again we look here at the first quarter and we'll see there are the figures you know and again if, if, if there's one Achilles <clears throat> and if, if Roscommon had lost a game or two here uh, and I'm going to say about the laws of averages if they those three games again I'm going to guess they'd have four points and that's not being disparaging that's just top, being very uh, mathematical about it. If, if there's one Achilles, and they were, it was a brutal Achilles in the first half against Galway, look at their expected score per shot after, after this is, I think, 26 minutes. It's 6-3. They're taking low percentage shots, 40 percenters. Look at Armada, they're getting into 71 percenters. And the key for me here, there's two keys. Uh, key number one is Armada playing into the wind, are forced to play, and it's a very similar team to Monaghan against Kerry, they play process Ulster football extremely well. Now, I think the worst thing ever happened to Armagh was their performance against Dublin and Crow Park last year because they played a Kerry game and everything landed for them. I say everything, they were brilliant kicks, they were brilliant. On the one goal, I think, bounced off the back of someone's shoulder and landed in the goal scorer's hands, if I remember correctly. Uh, and it was half an O'Boran Cup team with Dublin as well. When they, as we'll see in the second half, when they tried to play that game, it didn't work out for them. Uh, those six points, four of those were scored off kickouts they won that they didn't get a quick transition. Uh, process Ulster play, really grinding Ross Common down. Now, equally, we looked at this last week, and I'm intrigued by this, because I will say what I saw at first, that is the best defensive structure I've ever seen, and it potentially can be, and I'm obviously intimately familiar with, 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 with Armagh, because the amount of times Donegal played in, in key games last year. I will see, this is the Armagh defence. It's zonal, it's deep, it's arc-shaped, there's a double sweeper there I have on an oval sh- in the ovals on the 21. There's even a third sweeper out here. Maybe Ross Common have a few men back in their own half. And the problem with this that Ross Common were having was I've frozen it here. They're going coast to coast, bringing the ball from paint left to paint right. But I've frozen it here at the extremity of how they brought the ball across on a few of these attacks. So this is one attack 
It only goes across here. He's not even on paint right. Brings the ball back out. It's brought back out across. Now brought out again. Brought back across. As we're going to see in the second half, you need to go down the channels. You need to be brave and go down the channels. Suck our man in, as we'll see in a minute, uh, to get those scores. It was very passive over and over. And ultimately, it resulted in this. Again, look at the trajectory. It's 45 yards. It's over blocking hands. And that was more or less the story for me of that first 26 minutes. They just didn't really appear to have the capacity to break down our man. Okay. Kickouts are also a factor in this period. I know you, you focused on Armas restarts. Yeah, again, Armagh were being forced long. Obviously, our, uh, Roscommon ha- had the win, so they really pushed up aggressively. Solid, savvy tactic. Uh, but Armagh still went long and won five out of six early on. Just lo- lovely bit of subtle play here. The dark arts, as they say. Reed O'Neill is, uh, is in the dotted oval. Uh Looks like he's looking at the ball, but we see the man who comes with the fields in the actual oval. What happens? Is it an accident that Reed O'Neill collides with that Ross Common runner? That's really top class strategic play up fields that wins it. However, look, as well as you choreograph that, you're not going to win the ball. And I suppose it was intriguing because as that game went on, Ross Common scored four points in the next 10 minutes. Uh, but one of them really subtle, and I don't think I'll, I'll be surprised. Only picks up on the four Armagh men inside the the curved line there, uh, and again, it's something I'd often be big on. And I think the Armagh structure requires fourteen or fifteen behind the ball, but there's a problem with that particular fifteen behind the ball because you've got two corner forwards, a wing forward, and a an offensive midfielder. I'm gonna say in the same section of the field, and they all sort of follow the ball and no one follows the man and Ross Common by just doing the simple things when that random scenario occurs where our man have four offensive players two inside forward in the same section of the field it opens up Ross Common get a point they win the next kick out they score the quick transition next one they kick in I would have said a low percentage ball it's about to be turned over Jamar Hall again a four. I know he's in that workhorse role but Jamar Hall unnecessary foul and then the last one before half time, that was reasonably well worked. Probably a low percentage shot, but beautiful strike goes over. Uh, but at that stage, 8 7 to our man at half time, you're really fancying that they're going to kick on with the win and win it. Yeah, I think it's the old adage the wind, wind wins nothing. But I know you want to talk next about our man's defending, Russ Commons kick out, winning our man's kick out because the game did swing again. Yeah, well, I want to so I want to, I, I pick this one out particularly because, in comparison, as well, this is the full circle for me on the Armagh defence. And the Smith, uh, you know, you can't, I can't take away from his influence in the game. And it's uh, Ben O'Carroll, I think, up top. Uh, probably the two key performers. And Ender Smith, I have to make mention because we didn't cover the game two weeks ago. But Tyrone looked as comfortable as Armagh looked at this stage. He came off the bench, two Dermot Connolly esque plays, I'm going to say, assisted one goal broke the line, gave the secondary assist for the next goal. And again, here's the quality you need to break down the Armada defence. And this is what started happening in the third quarter. See how Smith has the ball here. There's four Armada men around him, but he's good enough to get out of there. He plays the ball down to uh, O'Carroll, if I have his name right, sorry. I was only studying my new, my, my new Russ Cobble facing this morning. Look at all the Armada boys facing him. But again, he's got the quality to have the ball in there, bring it back out. Now, what have we got over... The far side of that yellow line. One, two, three, four, five, six Armagh jerseys for Ross Common. Three man here on the edge of the D. Two more coming. Ball gets across. As it happens, they put this one wide, but it's a 70, 75% shot. And that was something they did three times in the in the next period of the game. Um, ultimately, didn't actually score off two of them, but there was a shift in, in, in the style of the play at the very least. Okay, so you mentioned that shift and... This was something they were able to continue because Roscommon did dominate maybe the next 13 to 15, 16 minutes. Well, look, they scored 1-3 uh, to one point uh, in the next period. And I suppose, as I say, ironically, those moves from Roscommon weren't what actually turned the game. Um, I suppose, again, it was that Roy Keane analogy. Roscommon pushed up on the kickouts, whereas Armagh mm-hmm. pushed up on the first kickout 
on Roscommon in the, in the first half, but then didn't after that. Even on dead ball where you have time, Roscommon looked to push up every time. And Armagh started going long. They started looking for the ball over the top. Now, they got one flick on, looked like they didn't they'd get a goal. But again, the analyst at me would say it wasn't as likely a goal as you might think because there's still a lot of football to be played. Defended well with a Roscommon man. Uh, straight into the half, Roscommon with a throw in, scored, won the kick out. Again, you're talking about 15 behind the ball or creative forward. Reed O'Neill, maybe a harsh foul, but it was a forwards tackle foul. Free over the bar off the kick out. Ball went down again. Another foul given away uh, by Forker. Um, and next thing, it's 10-8 to Roscommon. But the, for me, two or three things happened in this period. And again, it was nearly a carbon copy of, of Tyrone. Um, and I do think Tyrone may be a more capacity, more expansive. But that period of the game, two key things. Number one, this shot here probably sums it up. Our mass started hitting a lot of low percentage shots. And again, you see the trajectory. It's only outside the 21, but it's near the sideline. It's up and over. It's why they hit a few of those. And uh, they also, with the win, started trying to quick transition and having scored four points from six kickouts they won in the, in the first 26 minutes where it was all slow build up play. They got three quick transitions and get, got no scores off them. Uh, and ultimately, that, it was those turnovers and wives combined with Ross Common just being Roy Keane do all the simple things right, uh, do all the savvy things, that with a downturn in her mass fortune, obviously it swung the other way, and, and Ross Common went uh, from a point down at half time to two points up, you know, 10 minutes later into the win. Okay, so in one way, look, you're totally endorsed in Ross Common and how they break the, broke the blanket, rather, um, but at the same time, you're saying a lot of it, uh, unforced error, maybe errors, is the wrong way of putting it, but you're saying a lot of it is down to Armaz undoing no Christmas cards from anybody from Roscommon for you, Stephen. Well, again, I'm making the point that for me, it's a compliment to Roscommon that they're doing all this. You know, it's, it's how I play yeah. poker. You just don't do anything stupid. You keep doing the simple, sound percentage things. And they, gen apart from low percentage shooting in the first half, as they had in periods of their first two games, um, it, 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 it's a meticulously solid setup and game plan. I love it. Um, had Armagh maintained now I'm not saying that today be Armagh's game plan but I think if Armagh played the second half the way they played the first I think they probably the evidence is they probably have won the game but the, the, the wind is there there's that temptation for the quick transition to go long on kick outs and gamble a little bit instead of getting hands on ball and you know it, it started turning against them okay okay key moment the goal I know you want to talk about that and again I could, I could do a whole show of the percentages here Ultimately, Ross Common or Armar absolutely to push up. Uh, for me, modern inter county football, if you can get hands on ball on the D, unless there's something brilliant on, do. But, and again, whether this is by accident or design, I can't say. When you've got the record, Davy Burke has under 20 of Hull Ireland with, 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 with Kildare, um, club senior championship first year in Kildare, uh, Wicklow promoted to Division Three and stayed there. I'm given the benefit that this is strategically planned, that it's not an accident. But Armagh pushed up six, but Ross Common only have four in there. Um, and all of a sudden, it, it's gambling country because if Armagh win this kick out, it's a, it's a six v four in there. But ultimately, the ball is being kicked into a zone here where there's a lot more Ross Common players, and Armagh don't need all those bodies now. Again, I don't want to be seen to be having to go at Reed O'Neill, he's a fabulous footballer. But again, I'm often a big fan of the Lionel Messi role for these kind of guys. Stay up ahead of the ball. Weave your magic when you got it. Don't need you behind the ball. Like, as we, we see the first image here. It's It should be obvious to our man that either we know what's going on here and we're, we're, we're playing the percentages of not giving them hands on ball or we're... Sorry, we're playing the percent, or we don't know what's going on. Either way... By the time the ball is landing, um, it should be becoming apparent to Reed O'Neill here. There's a Roscommon man out of picture ahead of the ball. They have an extra player in the fielding area. Reed O'Neill is thinking like a forward here. Well, if we win this, I might get in for a handy score. But there's an unmarked Roscommon man 30 yards down the road. And Roscommon win the kick out. And, you know, I don't need to show you what happens from here because it's a 2v1. They get a penalty and they score it. So percentage-wise, absolutely. And... 
you know, I'd have radio during the Donegal Derry game last year for reasons we'll discuss again after 15 minutes. I don't care if you put 14 inside their half. You have to stop them getting hands on ball. So the percentage parameter is right with Armagh, but the execution there, you know, let's say somebody, maybe fingers getting pointed somewhere. Um, I'm saying maybe there was a, a forward mental, mentality in a key defensive position there and ultimately probably cost Armagh on that, on that particular kick out. Okay. Fair enough, but Roscommon did see out the game well in the end, didn't they? Maybe that comes from, or is it a too easy of a cliche to say they've won two tight games already going into this one, but they did, they used their experience of the past couple of weeks. and it got Yeah, and just, just quality game control. And again, something that separates a lot of the top coaches fr- from good coaches is they, they train for game scenarios. And I suppose Armagh, did well in fairness to our man credit words because they didn't do it against Mayo until they didn't do it against Mayo at all. They recovered that game on the high press. Um but the when the when the Mayo game was going against them, they did the common old school error and they started trying to attack too fast and too hurriedly. They did get a triple crossover and slow it down at one stage and settle the game. They were there thereabouts, but we look here on 62 minutes. This is quality for us common. And the Armagh boy here, I can't make out who it is with the arms up there between the 45 and the 65. Is that as clear and still image as it is on the video? He used to turn it around and say, lads, Roscommon have had the ball for, I think, 60 seconds at this stage. And he's saying, fellas, you know, what, what's going on? We can't let them keep the ball the whole game. And it's perfect game control by Roscommon because they hold the ball. They tempt you out. Mickey Hart's to road in the north. He's one of the masters. I learned a lot watching that team. And what happens? Now our mass start trying to come out. Ross come and get to what their terrors, man on man. Again, it's a forward at the front of the arc. Uh, man on man taking on Ross come and go up and they score the third point. Uh, to put them back to three points up and ultimately, though Armagh had their moments laid on, ultimately uh, saw the game out. Yeah. Okay, we're going to conclude with this one because I know we're keeping an eye on the stopwatch. But Stephen, any final take away from this one any just one key moment moments overall well look if i was to sub up the game um and, and a concept that you know this is you know i'm not giving away state secrets here um with club football because the percentages are completely different but in in inter-county division one top 10 12 football now um you can't if you can get hands on ball in the kick out, there's value in it. And if you're not value, you're getting hands on ball in the kick out in the first place. You've got a big problem. Uh, this isn't to have a go at Ethan Rafferty. I love what Armar are doing. My, my own keepers generally play the same. But this is early in the second half. You know, there's a hands on ball option there on that kick out. And that's what I'd have been taking. And I think if they went for those hands on ball kick outs, you know, Ross Common score off this kick out off a of free. Uh, and you see it's kicked there, the man is on. The next kick out is exactly the same. Ross Common win it. They don't score directly, but they do go up and weave a score. Uh, and again, inter-county football, yeah, if you've got the option for hands on ball, rarely there's a, a better option. And I do think if, if Armagh had taken that, looking at the stats of the first half when they, they, they got slow build-up plays, uh, they, they I think they probably cert- they certainly wouldn't have had that third quarter blip where the game ran away from them. Okay, fair enough. Um... Just for our viewers, we're trying to avoid repetition, but if you're new to the show, we're just covering the two matches that were aired live over any given weekend. And we normally know closer to the time, Stephen, don't we? I know there's a load of live matches next weekend. Kerry, our man, Mayo, Tyrone, they're both on Saturday on RTE and TG Car, respectively. And then Donegal taking on Galway and Letter Kenny, that one on TG Car. So probably two from those three, isn't that right, Stephen? Yeah, well, look, definitely, I've, I've been to seven out of eight uh, Division One teams now, so obviously I've left Donegal for as long as I could, but that's that's a key game next week, and obviously of interest to me personally. So, uh, yeah, if there'll be that one, I will we'll have a look closer to the date and what, what the second one will be. Yeah, definitely. We'll see how that game goes. If Galway win, we mightn't touch it. If Donegal win, we, we, we might dissect it. So, as I said, just finally, quick run through. Yeah, the Division 1 results from the weekend. Mayo 214, Kerry 110, Galway 16, Tyrone 13, Roscommon 112, Armagh 12 points, as we've seen there. And that is eight point victory for Vinnie Corey's Monaghan over Paddy Carr's Donegal 120 to 15 points. That is it for 
this week's Square D GAA Tactics and Analysis podcast from myself, Paddy McGill, and the main man, the brains behind the operation, Mr. Stephen O'Mara. We will talk to you next Monday. Uh, The show should drop on YouTube just after 9 p.m. Bye for now. Stay safe, and we will talk to you next week.